I'm Claudia McBride, President of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. Before we begin, please take a moment to silence your cell phones and other devices. But we do encourage you to tweet if you are so inclined. <laughs> Was that about tweeting? <laughs> I'd like to bring your attention to our outstanding lineup of programs for this fall. Um, we have on September 27th, Rami Khoury, who will discuss events in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings. On October 17th, the Council and the Pyramid Club will welcome Ken Feinberg. You may not know the name, but he is the renowned attorney known as the Compensation Czar who mediated the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund as well as the BP Spill Settlement. Uh, it should be quite interesting. Two major events scheduled for the fall include Jeb Bush, who will discuss his agenda for America, very timely, obviously. And that's on September 21st. On October 26th, the Council will host Pundit Palooza, an in-depth look at campaign politics and the presidential election. And we have Donna Brazil, a longtime Democratic strategist, along with Michael Smirkanish, a TV and radio host. That What will follow that discussion is the Star Spangled Celebration and Mock Election. It's a lot of fun. If you haven't joined us for an election year party, please do so. Our mock election is a bellwether for the real deal. We haven't missed in five elections. <laughs> We sell votes, by the way. <laughs> These events, along with the support of our members and partners, enable the Council to offer its most important work, and that is the programming for a diverse group of over 2,100 middle and high school students in 80 schools in this region. And we, what we do is we foster the skills and the sensibilities that they will need in order to thrive and compete in a knowledge-based global economy. So your support really does help in a very, very meaningful and consequential way. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge, and I'm back to tonight's event, a moment to acknowledge David Silverstein, thank you David, and Suzanne Kurtz of the Association for the Study of the Middle East and Africa and we're thanking and acknowledging them for their support and cooperation in presenting this evening's program. Thank you, and thank you for making the trip up from DC. And Professor Lewis is the chair of the organization. We're, sorry I didn't make that connection, an important one. Professor Lewis, we are delighted and we are honored to have you back at the World Affairs Council. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. We have a very eager audience to hear more about your notes on a century. I am going to forego the introduction because I know Buncey is planning to provide some context and background on your very rich life and your incredible legacy. But I do have to introduce Buncey. I am so happy to have my mentor and my friend, Buncey Ellis Churchill. Buncey is a President Emerita of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia, where she served for 23 years as president and many years before that. Um, Buncey was also the host of a daily radio show, Worldviews, for 10 years, and she is the co-author of Notes on a Century. On a personal note, I've already alluded to the significant role that Buncey has played in my life, professionally and personally, so it is uh, both ironic and bittersweet to be introducing Buncey at one of the last events that I will be um, chairing as the president of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia, where, of course, our relationship started and evolved. So, Buncey? Professor she has Lewis. Done a great job, hasn't she? Thank you, everybody.
everybody, and thank you for coming. <coughs> Before I go in and introduce you more formally to Bernard, I do want to say a, a, just a, a word or two about the writing of this book and why my name is on the title, considering it's a memoir of him. Um, and by the way, I have to tell you, he's gotten fabulous reviews for this book, except one. In Publishers Weekly, the reviewer said it's solipsistic. Well, I had to go and double check what solipsistic <laughs> meant. It means pertaining to self. What is a memoir? <laughs> anyway, the way this book was done is Bernard didn't want to do the book, and he protested. And I took a pile of at least three feet high of the paper of, of interviews and articles and stuff that we had and cut it, cut it into pieces. It was building the biggest jigsaw puzzle you ever saw. And then we shuffled it. I remember on a bed in, in the in Tel Aviv apartment, shuffling. And no, no, he didn't like that. And there were pieces I could have wanted six different uh, areas. But it finally came through. And um, his memory for the anecdotes is amazing. At the end of the process, he is <laughs> in his anecdotage. <laughs> Ready? Uh, okay, okay, but if you want to make nice comments yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, at the end of the process, when we finally got it off to the publisher, and the, the editor did a good job of sort of smoothing out some of the transitions. He said to me, I should give you a box, an empty box as a present. Well, it's not often you get, I mean, a present is lovely, but why an empty box? He said, so you can put your whip away. <laughs> <laughs> so, on to the program. So every word in the book is his. It's the organization and the, and if any of the, the juxtapositions seem a little strange, that's my fault. But the words are his. Bernard was born in 1916. For those of you who's at the, addition uh, isn't so good, that's 96 years. Um, he was born in London. He learned French, Latin, and German in school. And when he got through school, his headmaster wanted him to go to Oxford. But his father said no, he couldn't go to Oxford because he thought that Oxford and Cambridge were party schools. <laughs> so he went instead to the University of London to study Middle East history which, by the way, is not, was not then taught at Oxford or Cambridge. They taught Arabic, but not uh, history. And in his undergraduate years, he learned Arabic, Greek, and because a girlfriend made real demands on him, he also learned Yiddish. <laughs> she, you must have really loved her. <laughs> he wanted to be a poet, and he loves translating verse. And I have to share with you, for those of you who have the book, you will enjoy it, but my favorite poem which is from Yehuda Halevi. I will read to you because it, it applies to the number of you who are in this room. One gray hair appeared on my head. I plucked it out with my hand. It answered me. You have prevailed against me alone. What will you do when my army comes after me? <laughs> <laughs> so Yehuda Halevi was 11th, 12th century? Not bad for a thousand years ago. Um, he, so he, he loves poetry, he loves writing it, he loves translating it, and um, he also wanted to be a writer, but at some point in the course of his undergraduate years, he figured out that you have to be able to write about something. Uh, he got his BA in 1936, and I love, this is one of my favorite stories. Um, at graduation, his father was really concerned about whether he was going to graduate because he had been spending way too much time with a girlfriend. And in the course of the graduation ceremonies, he found out that not only was he first in Middle Eastern history, he was first of all the history specialists. So he got a first of the firsts, and with that was a prize to continue his studies. And he spent the first graduate year in Paris studying with a very famous Middle East historian, Louis Massignon. And the wonderful, I will tell you as to, Louis Massignon and Bernard didn't get along very well. And the question is, why not? Come on, come on, it's your story. Louis Massignon was a very distinguished French historian 
and uh, I was privileged to be his student. But he generally had a rather hostile attitude to me. And uh, I was never quite sure which was my offenses, whether it was as an Englishman for burning Joan of Arc, or as, <laughs> or as a Jew for crucifying Jesus. <laughs> So, and by the way, while he was in France, he... I was sort of amazed to find out that Bernard learned Turkish in Paris in French. Can you imagine learning Turkish? And for those of you who have some knowledge of, of Turkey or Turkish, the first famous Turkish female novelist, a woman named Halideh Adib, was the wife of his teacher of Turkish, which is a very... For Turks, that's a very impressive connection. Anyway, in his 1938, I'm not going to go through every year, uh, Gibb, his great teacher, Sir Hamilton Gibb, said, you've been studying the Middle East for four years. Isn't it about time that you went? And this was a, as the depression was sort of coming to a close, but Bernard's family had no way of sending him to the Middle East. And uh, Professor Gibb arranged for him to get a fellowship from the Royal Asiatic Society, and he spent six months of 1938 in the Middle East, 38, 39. Um, in 1940, just as the war is starting, Bernard's first book, which was his dissertation on the Ismailis, was published. It's his least favorite book because he never had a chance to edit it properly. During the war, at the beginning of the war, oh, Bernard, you have to tell that story. When he was signing up for the, the war, he had to fill in a form. The form asked his name and address his. Yeah, no, when, I, when I was registering for military service, I had a number of, there was a form to fill in, a number of lines, and one of the lines was race. Now, that was the first time, indeed, it was the only time I ever saw the word race in a British document. And I just didn't know what they meant. Um, we used the word race in many different senses. The only people who were talking about race at that time were the Germans. And I knew perfectly well what they meant. <laughs> so uh, I said to the sergeant who was presiding, I said, what am I supposed to put here? And he gave me the look of mixed, mixed pity and contempt, which sergeants reserved, reserved for new recruits, and said, don't you know what your race is? So I said, wait a minute, I'm not sure what that means. I said, am I supposed to put Jewish? And he said, no, he said, that's your religion. We have another line for that. We don't ask the same question twice. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, what am I supposed to put? Well, he asked me various questions about my family and so on. And then he said, well, obviously, your race is English. <laughs> <laughs> then they explained to me that as far as the British Army was concerned, there are four races. English, Scottish, Welsh, and Irish. <laughs> I don't have to be one of those four. Well, with the cleverness of armies, Bernard was assigned to a tank regiment. This is a man who doesn't, can't, find, he has a terrible sense of direction. So whether it was because of his ineptitude with tanks or his aptitude with languages, he was then assigned to the intelligence service, in, and it was in that department that he spent the rest of the war. Uh, he doesn't like to talk about it, though if you... He still feels bound by the Official Secrets Act. Um, but there's a little bit about it in the book, what we were able to pull out of it. When the war ended, he went back to the University of London, and you became the first teacher of Middle Eastern history in the UK. Yeah, well, not the first teacher of Middle Eastern history, but the first hole in the point For Middle East history. Um, in a history department. In a history department. In 1950, he was extraordinary, extraordinarily fortunate and was the first Westerner to be admitted to look at the Ottoman archives. And from that, he wrote a very major book called The Emergence of Modern Turkey, which is still in print and still in use today. Um, in 1974, because his marriage was dissolving, he accepted an appointment in Princeton to get away from London and his about-to-be ex-wife. Um, and it was the only time there was a joint appointment between Princeton University and the Institute for Advanced Studies. He was at Princeton for 12 years, and then in 1970 he was forced to retire, and at his retirement party with the economist uh, Charles Asawi made the comment, 
that uh, for, for them, both of them were retiring at the same time, retirement meant a new set of tires and full speed ahead. <laughs> and that is in fact what, what happened with, uh, with Bernard. He spent four years after his retirement at the Annenberg Center for Near East Studies, which happened to be at 4th and Walnut, right around the corner from then the World Affairs Council's uh, offices. And Bernard and I met at a party um, of the Philadelphia Committee on Foreign Relations. And at that time, I had done all my graduate and undergraduate work about Egypt, and he was doing Turkey. So I had no idea who he was. And so we just had a great time, and that was, and we started to have lunch together. The great, he hated this, this job. He was there for four years. He, they gave him a corporate board, and as an academic institution, these things do not go well together. And Bernard was having trouble, and so we met, and I had been dealing with a board for a long time, so explained to him how board boards worked, and that a board could have one of the three Ws, work, wisdom, or wealth. Or it could have one of the three G's, give, get, or get off. And Bernard, like this, came back and said, my board has the three I's, incompetence, interference, and ignorance. <laughs> Um, after four years, he left Annenberg, and he does say that the best thing that happened to him in Philadelphia was meeting me, which is very nice. Uh, um, you're supposed to hold the microphone, so we say that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, it was in his retirement that he ended up re writing more than a dozen books. He has written 32 books. They've been translated into 29 languages hundreds and hundreds of articles. And one of the things that I argued with uh, the editor of this book most was that I insisted that she have a complete curriculum vitae of his works at the back of the book. Because it, nowhere does it exist. Even the Princeton University uh, website ha is 15 years old in terms of what he had accomplished. Um, he has received many, many honors, um, including 15 honorary doctorates. And one of the nicest comments about him was made by Henry Kissinger, with whom he used to have lunch uh, oh, once or twice a year. And Kissinger said, you know, I really enjoy having lunch with you. And Bernard said, why? And Kissinger said, well, for me, it's a unique experience. I listen. <laughs> <laughs> he does know 15 languages, though he will argue as to what he knows and what he doesn't. And I depends what you mean by knowing. <laughs> I say, it depends what you mean by knowing. Well, some of these he knows, he's very fluent. And I have been with him in Turkey and in Italy when I have heard natives say to him, what part of the country are you from? <laughs> so he knows English, French, German, Latin, Greek, Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, Italian, Russian, Yiddish, and of course the four Middle Eastern languages, Turkish, Hebrew, Arabic, and Persian. And he makes very convincing noises, even in languages that he doesn't know. <laughs> I will never forget he was talking to a waitress when we were ordering, and it turned out she was Hungarian. And so you said to her, Kissy Chocolum. Which means, I kiss your hand. And she was so excited. <laughs> and so she started talking to him Hungarian. He said it beautifully, but that was the extent of his Hungarian. <laughs> I think the expression Casey Chocolum, I wonder what would happen if you said Casey Vanilla Um or Casey <laughs> Strawberry Um. You have no idea what they'd be kissing. Uh, so I, I have lots of questions written here, um, but I, I've given you a, a, some, a very brief synopsis of Bernard's life. It's been an extraordinary life. He's met extraordinary people. and But I'd like to open it up to any specific questions that you may have. You certainly are welcome to question him about what he has done or who he has met, but also what he, um, what he thinks about certain elements of what's happening in the Middle East. The only thing he really doesn't want to talk about is what happened yesterday in Syria, or because he feels that his knowledge on those subjects is not as deep as it once was because in the olden days, he had students at, in every capital in the Middle East uh, from the School of Adva uh, Oriental and African Studies at uh, London and also at Princeton. But so he doesn't have the, the contacts that he once had. Um, so do, does anybody want to start with? Yes, sir. Uh, the United States has had a really loud period. 
the United States has had a rather good experience in its attempts at nation building. Na attempts at nation building. In Iraq and Afghanistan. Is there something about, um, fundamentally about Islamic societies that makes them different, say, from Germany and Japan, where sometimes we point to them as examples of successful nation building after World War II? Why isn't that possible in the Middle East? What I repeat, uh, why is a nation building possible in the Middle East? Could also add to that, perhaps, is democracy possible in the Middle East? Yes. <laughs> well, the Middle East has had a very difficult time, remember. It's gone through a series of conquests, for long periods of foreign rule, and, uh, and sometimes something even worse than foreign domination is liberation which can be very difficult and painful. And um, uh, the peoples of the Middle East have had great difficulty in adjusting to the present situation. And above all, they have had great difficulty in accepting responsibility for their own affairs. And for so long, it has been normal and well-grounded to blame others for everything that went wrong. They still do that, although it's no longer the case. Uh, Bernard, there's a, um, what, for five, okay, I'm going to continue with that question, if I may. For 500 years, the Ottoman Empire imposed authoritarian rule on much of the Middle East. What's the difference between the rule of the sultans and the rule of the tyrants? Well, we have to be careful when we use the term authoritarian to understand what we mean. A authoritarian rule doesn't mean the same thing as dictatorship. The traditional form of government in the Middle East and the old, under the pre-modernized Islamic regimes was authoritarian, but the authority was limited. And very often, and in many important respects, authority came not from above, but from within the group. Um, there's a remarkable group of books written by a British naval officer called Slade, who spent much of the 19th century <coughs> traveling around the Middle East, and he knew Middle Eastern languages. And his books about the Middle East are extraordinarily good. And he makes this point very clear. He says that um, what the change is brought about by modernization was catastrophic in two respects. They greatly increased the powers of control and repression of the government, and they greatly reduced the powers of resistance by virtually eliminating all those other sources of authority that existed under the old order. For example, um, there's a passage which I very much like and I often quote, written by a French ambassador in Istanbul in about, oh, I don't remember the exact name, but it was shortly before the French Revolution, when the French monarchy was still alive and seemed to be quite well. And the French government had given him certain instructions to proceed with negotiations, and the negotiations were proceeding very, very, very slowly. And the French government sent the ambassador a rather nasty letter, saying, why are you taking so long? Why don't you get on with it? And the ambassador's reply is, I think, the historic document of major importance. He said, here, he said, meaning here in Turkey, here in the Middle East, he said, it is not, it is not like in France, where the king is sole master and does what he pleases. He said, here, the Sultan has to consult. He has to consult with the holders of office. He has to consult with the retired former holders of office. He has to consult with the heads of the craft guilds. He has to consult with the heads of the trade corporations, and so on and so on and so on. And this was absolutely <laughs> true at that time. In the traditional Middle Eastern order, they did have to consult, because there were all sorts of institutions where authority, as I said before, came from within and not from above. Modernization ended that. It greatly reinforced the power of the state and virtually eliminated the capacity of resistance. So that the, the modern dictatorship is a result of modernization, or if you like, to be more specific, a result of westernization. It's a sad and tragic result. Yes, please. 
Could you address the issues of uh, Turkey in looking at um, ascension to the EU? Uh, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What is your opinion? Will Turkey get into the EU? And if they do, is it a good thing or a bad thing? And if they don't, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, at the moment, the way things are going in Turkey, I don't think it's very likely. I mean, the present government in Turkey he wants to go in the opposite direction. They are thinking in terms of reviving the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> <laughs> and Majid says they don't want to pay the Greek debt. Please. Do you see a resolution to the conflict between Israel and Palestine? And if so, on what terms and under conditions on both sides? Okay. Do you see a, a resolution to the conflict between Israel and Pal between the Israelis and the Palestinians? That is, of course, one of the crucial questions in the region. I think the first question one has to ask is, what is the issue? What is the conflict about? What I mean is this. Is the question the existence of Israel, or is it the size of Israel? Is the issue, should Israel exist, or should it not exist? In that case, obviously, there is no solution. There is no compromise position between existing and not existing. And the conflict will continue until the Arab states either achieve their purpose of destroying Israel or renounce their purpose. And so far, there doesn't seem much prospect of either. If, on the other hand, the conflict is about the size of Israel, which it would be if the Arabs do give up their purpose of destroying Israel, then it becomes a nice, simple, normal conflict like ourselves for Rain or Texas. <laughs> <laughs> which means that after centuries of struggle, conflict, battle, diplomacy, soon or later, some sort of compromise solution may be worked out. We're not there yet, but I think it's possible to move in that direction. Imagine. Um, it's been about six seasons, maybe, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring again, and the Arab world, uh, with the changes in uh, Tunisia, Egypt, pressures in other places like Bahrain. Uh, do you think this will continue in other countries such as Saudi Arabia or Jordan? Is there a chance for the Arab Spring to spring in Saudi Arabia or Jordan, or has it sprung? I'm a historian. I deal with the past. <laughs> um, I really can't predict the future. Um, you remind me of um, an incident many years ago. I was attending an international congress. And um, at some point during the discussion, he said... Uh, no, you used the expression. Uh, is, that you yes, on? at some point. I used the expression, Islamic terrorist. Mm -hmm. Islamic terrorist. And he took exception to that. He interrupted, he said, there is no such thing as an Islamic terrorist. He said, Islam is totally against terrorism. If, if anybody commits an act of terrorism, he is not Islamic. I said, well, what he meant, of course, was that if a Muslim who commits it, it's not terrorism. <laughs> Bernard, who is the most impressive leader that you have met? The most impressive leader? The Pope, I think. Yes. Which one? The Polish one. <laughs> I, I met him a number of times. I, 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 when he became Pope, when he became Pope, he very naturally wanted to do something to help his country, Poland. But it was very difficult. Poland was then under communist dictatorship, and he had to be very careful what he did. And then he had what I thought was a brilliant idea. Uh, the Vatican has a summer home in the mountains in the north of Italy where they go and spend a few months during the summer. What? At Castel Gandolfo. And what he did was this, that each summer, he invited a number of people from Poland to come and stay at Castel Gandolfo as his house guests. And even the communist authorities in Poland couldn't really object to that. They were just, there was nothing political about it, there was no public statement. They just went there as house guests of the Pope and stayed there for a couple of months. At the same time, he invited a number of house guests from the Western world, carefully chosen, 
to match the his Polish guests. The same interests, the same professions. And um, I was part of that process for a number of years. Um, I did it in the first year, they found me helpful, so they asked me to come again and again and help them in choosing the people to come. And it was an extremely interesting experience. And I, at that time, as I say, I got to know the Pope fairly well and formed an extremely positive opinion of him. I think he was a truly remarkable man. Um, what he was a, he, he, he asked at least one. Uh, when he was asked, uh, what did he think of the, the Jews? Well, I'll give both. Okay. <laughs> he wants to give both. There are two, two particular recollections. Um, you may recall that at one point, the Pope went on a visit to the Caribbean, and to everyone's astonishment, was invited to go and see Castro. <coughs> and when he came back, I was there shortly after that, and I was with him having lunch. And one of my fellow lunch guests said, why did Castro invite you to go there? Does that mean he wishes to rejoice? To return to the church? And the Pope said, no, I wouldn't say that. He said, I think that Senor Castro is looking for what I believe you call in English a soft landing. <laughs> <laughs> My other recollection was when, again, at one of his lunches, somebody asked him what was his attitude to Jews and Judaism. And without a moment's hesitation, he answered, as to an elder brother. Oh. That's really profound. Uh, Bernard, I only want to ask you about one or two others. Um, when you were in the Secret Service during the war, the head of the Secret Service was the very famous uh, C. Did you ever meet C? I did, just once. And what happened? I'm not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't remember anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then I want to ask you about uh, who was the most impressive person that you didn't meet? You see, I really have worked on this book. I do know what's in it. The great tragedy of my life was that uh, on one occasion during the war, the Prime Minister, Mr. Churchill, visited the unit when I was working. And it just so happened that on that occasion I was on leave. So I would have been able, I would have been able to say for the rest of my life that I had met Winston Churchill, but I couldn't. I was just on leave. And as I said, it's the great tragedy of my life. But there were one or two stories about Churchill during the war yeah. that are truly yeah, there amazing. Yeah, stories about Churchill. Um, you may recall that during the war we had a number of governments in exile in London. And after the Germans invaded and conquered Greece, we also had a Greek government in exile in London along with all the others. And the Greek government in exile was an uneasy coalition of different parties. And as is often the case with coalitions, kept on breaking up and reforming, breaking up and reforming. And then at a certain point, a military strongman <coughs> appeared, a Greek general, you may recall the name, he played some role in post-war Greece, General Plastiras. And the hope was that he would be the Greek divorce. So Churchill went in to inform the cabinet of this. And the way he did it was such was that within minutes it was circulating all around the network. He even reached my level. Churchill went in and said to his cabinet colleagues, Oh gentlemen, he said, we have a new Greek prime minister. General Plasteras. Let's hope he hasn't got feet of clay too. <laughs> That's not a joke, that really happened. <laughs> the other one was um, when Hitler decided to invade the Soviet Union, we suddenly became allies. And Churchill sent a military mission from Moscow. Uh, headed by a rather dour Scottish general. His name, if I remember rightly, was not first. Uh, they were set up in, in a hotel in Moscow, and the Russians, in true Soviet st style, showed them nothing, told them nothing, took them nowhere. <laughs> and General McPherson, being a dour Scot, 
Since he had nothing to report, he sent no report. <laughs> Days passed, weeks passed, no reports. And Churchill got really angry and he had this military mission in Moscow, presided over, headed by a general, and he wasn't getting anything, so he, uh, he sent an angry message to the Prime Minister London to direct to head British military. General Commanding British Military Division in Moscow. All that we know is that it's raining in Moscow. Would welcome further information. <laughs> and the reply came back immediately. It's General Commanding British Military Division in Moscow, the Prime Minister London. Interested to learn from your message that it's raining in Moscow. We are not allowed to look out of the window. Bernard, <laughs> 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 I'm going to turn to the audience again. Do you, any of you have? Any questions, or I have still plenty to go, but I want to no, give you a chance. Story. How can I stop? Uh, I said one other story I remind you of. You know, when, when the Germans invaded Russia, we, by, by we I mean the British, we did everything we could to help them by sending supplies. The Russians very soon ran out of everything. They were totally unprepared for the war. So we spent right by the Arctic route, to the Arctic port of Arkhangelsk, and uh, we sent convoys, ships, loaded with supplies of various kinds, and escorted by destroyers of the Royal Navy. And at a certain point, the Russians wanted to show their appreciation for this help. So they gave two receptions in Arthagelsk, one for the officers, the other for the sailors of the Royal Navy, to show their appreciation. And uh, parted duly to place. And after the parties were over, they went back on board ship, and not surprisingly, the officers and the sailors began exchanging reminiscences, exchanging their impressions of what they had seen. And one of them, one of the comments, <coughs> immediately made the rounds, everybody heard it. They, talking about the food, one of the officers said to the sailors, what was the food like? And the sailors said, well, the food was all right, but the jam had a fishy taste. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like caviar for the... Uh... <laughs> That's not a joke that really happened. I remember that time. Bernard, I want to, uh, being that half this audience is female, I'd like to, in Islam, a woman is worth half a man in testimony, in compensation, and in inheritance. Do you think that there's any hope that Islam will change its attitude toward women? There are signs of change, yes. In Tunisia, for example. Uh, Tunisia, as far as I know, is the only Muslim country where education for women is compulsory from the age of five. So in Tunisia, women are literate and play a role in society without parallels on the parts of the world. And uh, there are signs of development in that direction. I would go even a step further and say women are the best, if not the only, hope of the Islamic world. Some questions from the audience, please. Muslim schools, Muslim institutions in the United States have pretty much been radicalized. Do you see any either change in that or, or hope for change uh, in, in the future? Um, the, the question is that a number of years ago Bernard made the comment that uh, mosques and uh, Muslim institutions in the U.S. were radicalized because it was the Wahhabis who were setting these up and it's the most radical of the uh, Islamic sects. And so the question is, do you see any change in that? Is there, what's the situation? I don't see any serious change. <laughs> oh, Majid would like to respond, yes. I would agree that many of them. Um, Majid Al Sayyab, friend of the council. And where from? I was born in Iraq, originally to an Iraqi father and American mother, and um, grew up with Christianity and Islam in, in my life. Uh, but I am a Muslim. And, and I was with a, a Jordanian friend, a member of the royal family of Jordan, just a few weeks ago, and she was complaining that her Spanish husband had converted to Islam, but taking him to the local mosques was not a good experience, that he got a very negative impression of, of Islam, and that it was quite, uh, not the liberal Islam that she knew. So we have discussed and agreed that we're starting a, 
an Islamic group in Philadelphia that is liberal. And it'll be co-founded with a woman from, from Jordan, from the royal family, and myself. So. I will put you in. He's an extraordinary man who has an organization, and he calls himself an American Muslim, American first, and a Muslim. He's, he's really amazing. I have to tell you, uh, in the cocktail party, Majid raises horses. So I said, how are your horses doing, especially in this heat? And he said, they're Arabian. <laughs> um, questions from the audience, please. Uh, I'm a high school teacher, so I'd like to ask a teacher's question. Uh, what do you think are some of the most important things for us to teach young Americans about this region that you've devoted a lifetime to study? What are the most important things that American teachers can teach our students today about the Middle East or Islam? About its history and about the respects in which it resembles us and the respects in which it differs from us. I mean, it is a different civilization with a different history, but one which has important elements in common with our Western civilization. I think it's important that they should know something about that civilization and its long and distinguished history. One, I occasionally lecture on Islam. Don't get upset. <laughs> but uh, since Bernard and I co-authored a book on Islam, and one of the things I find when I'm lecturing is that Americans tend to assume that everybody is like us. Yeah. And they're not. And the values are different. I'm not saying they're better or worse. But for example, um, in America, if you hire your nephew, that's considered not such a good thing. That's nepotism. In the Middle East, it's considered a fine thing. You're helping your family. So who is to say? But there are real differences uh, in how these two civilizations look at things. Any other questions from the audience, please? Uh, should, you not, should the United States uh, back the democratic process in voting in the Middle East, even if it leads to the election uh, of a radical group? I'm thinking specifically of Egypt. If we back the current process, and there's a good chance the Muslim Brotherhood Take over the leadership. They're not a group that we want that to happen. So, what should be our position? What should the U.S. position be on the democratic processes in the Middle East, and uh, your opinion about elections in the Middle East? I think it was always a great mistake to assume that our way of doing things is the law of nature and the best in the world, and that others must follow our example. You know, after World War One, the Western world obliged the Germans to adopt a Western-style electoral system, and they elected Hitler. Um, uh, people should be allowed to develop their own institutions according to their own traditions and in their own ways, and not have things forced upon them from outside. I think that the idea of imposing elections in the Middle East is, is a disastrous mistake. Um, it gives immediate advantage to, to the worst people. Um, in an election, the, the Muslim fanatics have two immense advantages. One is that they use a language which is meaningful and immediately understood. The Democratic and progressive parties have a terminology which is mostly modern and translated from Western languages that doesn't resonate with the great mass of the population. The language of the religious people does. It immediately resonates and is understood. And the second advantage that they have is that through the pulpit, the mosque, they have a network of communication which no other group can hope to equal. So I would say it is, it is very unwise to insist prematurely on democratic institutions. They will develop their own institutions in their own way, in their own time. But what do we do now that Egypt is having an election and it looks like the Islamists, the Islamic bro you know, the Muslim Brotherhood will come to power? Remember that Hamas came to power in a free and fair election. Exactly. Is there anything for as, us to do? But is there anything that the U.S. should be doing or do we just stay out of it? I, I think we should refrain from trying to impose our form of democracy. Okay. Any other questions? Please. Yeah, thank you. Um, for your experience with, with Turkey, and Iraq, that region, with the Kurds, and the U.S. relationship with the Kurds as well. What can we learn from that? Where does that, where, where does that land up in terms of possible resolution? It's, enough, it's a question that's enough to curdle your blood. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.
What happens with the curves? It's a very important question. The curves are a very distinct group. They have their own ethnicity, their own language. And unlike the others, they have, they have not had their own state. They, the, the large Kurdish population in Iraq, a large Kurdish population in Turkey, and, in, and smaller ones in some other countries. And um, the Kurdish movement is still very powerful and has very considerable support. They consider all support in those areas. Um, I remember <clears throat> talking once with a Turkish friend of mine about the Kurdish question in Turkey. There's a very large Kurdish population. And I said to him, why can't the Turks and the Kurds live together in one state in Turkey, like the English and the Scots in the United Kingdom? And he answered immediately without a moment's hesitation. He said, the Kurds are Scots, they're Irish. <laughs> A good answer, but not an accurate one. <laughs> Four months before uh, the Americans uh, went to war against Iraq in 2003, I was muttering things to a few friends that I couldn't understand the U.S. position. And there's a reason. I still don't understand it. Um, Saddam Hussein may have had weapons of mass destruction, but he didn't have a delivery system. He had no Navy, he had no <coughs> Air Force, and I was saying, oh, he's no threat. Could you argue against that, please? Tom's question is um, that Saddam Hussein at some point may have had weapons of mass destruction, but he had no <coughs> delivery system and therefore was not a threat. Bernard, I'm going to let you answer that, but first, I have most many of these people are my friends, so I have to share with you Bernard's best line ever. That in 2001, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and you remember we went after him and then didn't left very quickly and didn't finish off. 91, was it? 1990. Um, but Bernard, uh, at that time, they were talking about the Gulf War and should we have continued or not. And Bernard said, what they should have called the Gulf War is Kuwaitis Interruptus. <laughs> Now, could you answer Tom's question that um, Saddam may have had uh, weapons of mass destruction, but he had no delivery system, he wasn't a threat, and did we overreact, or what, 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 how do you want to follow that? I'd be much stronger than the word overreact. How about wrong? Was U.S. policy then wrong to do what we did in Iraq at that time? No, I think Saddam Hussein was obviously a, a major danger. We had to do something about it. But I don't think that what we did was the right thing. Mm. Afterwards, you may recall, there was a, Iraq was divided into the two separate zones. The northern zone was functioning very, very well. And uh, at one point, they had a proposal to establish a provisional government of free Iraq in Iraq. A provisional government of free Iraq in Iraq would have been really meaningful. And that I think we should have helped them with, but we didn't. Another question? Please. I have a question about medieval history. It seems to me that the British have a, have a, a, a thought of adulation towards a, 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 Sul, a Saladin. Uh, uh, in, in contrast to, to, to Richard the Lion who's a, who a, uh, uh, less of, what do you think of the, of, 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 of the, uh, of Saladin uh, uh, and how the British think? The question is, what do you think of Saladin and how the British respond to him, or did respond to him? It's not often you get a medieval question. No. He was a very important, very distinguished, and very successful leader. And I think one may add that he was, according to the standards of the time, an honorable and a decent man. Hmm? And he was a Kurd. And he was a Kurd, yes. 
Um, you remind me of an episode. Once I was sitting in the, uh, in, in, I forget which library in this temple, in one, one of the collections of manuscripts, <coughs> and there was a, a delegation from the Arab League who were there to catalog the manuscripts, Arabic manuscripts. And an argument started between the Turks and the Arabs about Saladin. And uh, the Turks said, well, Saladin was a Turk, and the Arabs said, no, Saladin was an Arab. And the Turks said, no, he was a Turk. And Arabs, oh. it, it batted it back and forth for quite a while. Eventually, they turned to me and they said, well, you're neither a Turk nor an Arab, you're a historian of the Middle East. Uh, which was he? Was he a Turk or an Arab? And they said, well, he was neither, he was a Kurd. And both the Turks and the Arabs there were absolutely shattered. But the servant who was sweeping the floor turned around and gave me a look. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Hi. Um, a few days ago, I heard Joe Biden speak at a Biden seminar in Wilmington, Delaware. And one of the um, things he, he said is that if the current administration loses the election in November, it will be for one of two reasons. What happens in Europe and what might happen in the Straits of Hormuz if the Israelis bomb the Iranians. I just wondered what your take might be on that last part of his comment. I'm a historian, I only deal with the Yes, yes, sir. Why did the, why did the um, Arab world decline and why did the Western world ascend? There happens to be a superb book that he wrote on that subject. <laughs> yes. He said, why did the, what went wrong it was what a wrong Bernard's uh, yes. first bestseller. It was one, it came out about a month after 9-11 and everybody wanted to know who were these people. And he wrote this book, What Went Wrong? Why did Western civilization ascend as Islamic civilization descended? Right. And uh, Bernard, in two seconds, what went wrong? <laughs> <laughs> they adopted certain basic policies which I think were profoundly mistaken. Um, they decided that at a certain point, all the questions had been answered, and there were no more questions, and therefore no more no uh, no innovation of any kind, and that that, that was the doom of the civilization. I should mention that that book was very successful. And Bernard made money on that. And he's always maintained that if he ran into Osama bin Laden, Osama should get a part of those royalties because it was 9-11 that catapulted this book into the, uh, the bestseller list. We're going to conclude now, but I would like to ask Bernard to read the last two pages of his book. Um, it summarizes, in a way, his life. For my 90th birthday, the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia sponsored a day-long conference attended by over 600 people on Islam and the West. It featured an encomium by Vice President Dick Cheney and presentations by Henry Kissinger, Fuad Ajami, Ayan Hirsiali, and others. Bunsi says that when she called Fuad to tell him about my forthcoming milestone, he exclaimed, 90? Oh, don't tell him. <laughs> During my 90th year, I had the usual messages of congratulation and goodwill, including one from an Israeli friend using a common Israeli formula, but with an interesting difference. The common Israeli phrase when offering birthday greetings to the elderly is to say, Admiyav Esrim, till 120. The change of one Hebrew consonant made this Admiyak Esrim, till 100, like 20. That's <laughs> preferable. On walks now, I must use a cane or a walker. I need hearing aids. I take naps. My short-term memory is not what it used to be. And she says, soon I will be normal. <laughs> I have deteriorated physically and mentally, but not emotionally. I have loved my life. I have had a rewarding career. 
32 books translated into 29 languages isn't bad. I have explored places and cultures and been able to play with 15 languages. Even those who dislike me or with whom I have heartily disagree are usually interesting and sometimes even stimulating. I have a family and devoted friends whom I cherish. I have been and am very fortunate. Thank you so much for this extraordinary treat. This was uh, one heck of an evening. And if any of you pen your memoirs, you can now say that you met the great Bernard Lewis. Um, I have to tell you, oh, let me grab my book. Okay, this is my copy. And these are just a few of the notes. It is extraordinary. Please take some time. The sweep of history and how it's described, the personal experiences, the humor, the anecdotes. I don't know how you have this recall, but it is fascinating. So please, if you haven't received your book, uh, don't forget it on the way out. Thank you for joining us. But most of all, thank you so much, Bernard Lewis and Buncey Churchill, for joining us today.